Hello, everybody. This is Kristen Hardy, and I am joined here with my co-host. Emil Oviagele. And we are back for another episode of Bottom Up. I am so excited today. We have a very special guest. Uh, this is a personal friend of both Emil and I, Rebecca Lopez. Uh, I'm going to give Rebecca an opportunity to introduce herself. But before she does that, because I feel like she's not going to brag about herself at all. Um, but if you don't know Rebecca, she's a partner over at Godfrey & Khan, a newly minted partner. Can we still say that? I think so, yeah. Snap, snap, snap. A newly minted partner. She's also a Marquette Law grad. Um, she has so many interesting stories. Uh, and above all else is... You know, one a good one of the good ones. Um, still a, an excellent lawyer, but then also a great personal friend, um, and a good human who's always looking out to to help other people. Um, this is her second career. I feel like I'm like I'm not going to steal all your thunder. This is her second career. She's won many many awards and accolades. Um, but Rebecca, I want to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your journey, um, and ultimately we're going to get into talking about making partner because we know that is a question that's on every young lawyer's mind. So take it away. Thank you, Kristen. That was one of the nicest intros I've ever had, so awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, so a little bit about myself. Well, one, I'm really excited to be here with both of you, and you are both very good friends, and so I'm looking forward to the discussion we're going to have. Um, going way back, I'm originally from the city of Milwaukee, born and raised, uh, grew up here, and um, as Kristen shared, law was a second career for me, and um, I found my way to law through working previously in government and working with people, um, and that ultimately led me to Godfrey and & Kahn, and, and now I've been with the firm for, for 10 years, which went by really quickly. Times it didn't seem like it went by so quickly, but uh, when you look back, it did. Uh, and so I've been practicing in employment law at Godfrey & Kahn during that time. Outside of work, um, I'm a mom, and uh, that's something that I'm really proud of. My daughter is all grown up, so I'm an empty nester, and that's <laughs> a new adjustment. And um, one of the things that's really important to me is my community. I, I consider Milwaukee to be my community. I consider Wisconsin to be my community, but I also look at the country as a whole and the important role that we all play. And so a big part of my practice also is about giving back and supporting those who live around me in the broad sense and in the more narrow sense. That's awesome, Rebecca. So Rebecca mentioned she has a daughter, so I do want to get into that a little bit later, kind of that balance between um, being a mom, showing up as a wife, and then showing up to be ultimately be a partner, being a law student, and then being a practicing lawyer. Uh, but before we get into that, you've talked about your second career, so let's talk about your first career. Um, tell us about that first career and how it led you, ultimately led you into law. So I, um, I always go back to my parents, so I'm rewinding a little bit here, but I, you know, I'm very grateful for the upbringing I had and, and for my parents and their influence over me. And in growing up, um, we were always very involved, but um, I was also someone who had an independent streak and, um, and I wanted to be able to contribute. And so I started working at the age of 14, um, working in the community. And then I remember my first job when I had my first work permit. And I share that because each experience built on the next. I feel like with every experience you have, you're gaining skills, you're gaining knowledge, and there's something to be um, learned from it, even if it's short term. So I, uh, when I was in college, I worked all through college. I was working between 30 and plus hours a week um, to get through school and support my family. And when I was getting close to graduation, I got to a point where I had no idea what I was going to do next. I didn't think working as a teller at a bank was really in my long-term, like, desire. And um, I had remained active and volunteered all through undergrad as well. And it was those experiences that led me to an opportunity to work for a United States Senator. So the United, uh, United States Senator Russ Feingold was looking for someone to um, – a support immigration casework. He had a very large practice. An incredibly accomplished attorney was already working in the firm, but there was just a lot of need, and so they were looking for someone to come in and support him. And um, in addition to that, um, there was an opportunity to continue to build on all the great work that he had already been doing and his staff had been doing with the Latino community. So um, because of my volunteer work in the community, someone shared my name. It's, you know, those people who speak your name in a room, right? Um, and that was Salvador Sanchez, and I'm really grateful to him because as a result of that, 
discussion, um, I had the opportunity to do one of the greatest jobs. Um, I worked uh, learning how to be an advocate for people who are dealing with immigration issues. Um, I traveled all around the state of Wisconsin and met with advocates for the Latino community and helped to bring their messages back to the senator and to Washington, D.C. and advocate for policies and um, really learned how to listen. Um, you know, lawyers, we can talk. We're good at it, uh, but one of the most critical key things we have to learn how to do, and this is something I had to learn, um, was how to be a really good active listener. And I learned that through my outreach efforts for the senator, um, but also in working with the constituents who needed help. And it was through that experience of working with local immigration attorneys who are advocating for their clients and getting support from the senator's office that I thought, wow, that's what lawyers do. I had, like, I only knew what you know, most people know is what yeah. you see on TV, right. the like really exciting courtroom mm -hmm. things, but there were no lawyers in my family. And so I didn't, one didn't know what they did and two didn't think I could be that. Um, and so once I started working like hand in hand with local immigration attorneys and they were all very encouraging, um, I thought, wow, this is great. Like you can advocate for someone and help them along the whole way. And the one thing that's preventing me from helping someone with the entire process is getting my law degree. And I see now that that, that's something that could be achievable. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what led me to go to law school. I, I, I got to say, um, you are one of the most empathetic person that I know personally. I've, I've always been a fan of yours, and I still am a fan of yours. And um, I, I knew of you, and I think a lot of us did, even when we were in law school, because especially in the big law firm world that mm -hmm. you were in, at least you're one of the more visible yes. people of color um, and we saw you out there, and despite you not knowing who a lot of us were, and even not knowing who I was at the time, um, there was some sort of symbiotic um, exchange of energies. Like, hey, if, if she could do it, and you know, and, and she, not just do it, because I, I, I didn't even know what type of law you practiced for a very long time, but I, I saw you in all these different spaces, these different community spaces, um, and I realized you were also a lawyer, and it was very inspirational. So. Um, Having all of that background, having developed um, a passion for advocacy for your community, how were you able to to merge that with, you know, private law? <laughs> you know, because you're not working in a government context or in an advocacy, in, in not an advocacy context, in, in a nonprofit context, right? You're working for a private for a private firm, a large private firm. How do those two things come together? Um, not easily all the time, right? I, um, I you know, I want to be fully transparent in, you know, what it's like, um, because it, it is challenging uh, to, to mix both of those things. But I, even through law school, I talked about the things that, um, I call them make my heart happy things. Um, now we talk about refilling our cup. Mm -hmm. And I, I really like that latter um, description. And, um, what I like about law is I, I, I really enjoy working with my clients, advocating for them, and helping them get to their goals and their end result, being a partner with my clients and getting them through whatever that finish line is. And in employment law, oftentimes it's dealing with un the unexpected and unfortunately crises moments. And that's where you know, I feel like we spring into action and we're there to be their support through some difficult times. In order to do that well, you have to be very good at learning the substance and learning the practice of law. And that process is tough. It's a steep learning curve. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. You graduate law school, you get the law degree, and then you get into practice and you're like, I still have so much to learn. And I felt like it was a four year learning curve to do that. And it was stressful. And there are times I doubted myself throughout this entire process. Um, and so first and foremost, it was figuring out my environment, figuring out how I was gonna navigate that environment and figuring out how to learn in doing that. But I had to refill my cup because a lot of that uh, learning and doing that process, you know, it, it takes a lot out of you. Um, so I always found that going back to um, trying to be supportive of others, there's something about seeing other people succeed mm -hmm. and being able to support them that 
I think gives me the most gratification. I feel the most happy when I'm able to do that. And so that's where um, staying involved, whether it was you know through law school or through the community, that I, I really found a space where I felt fulfilled. And, and so it's a lot of long hours. Um, and you, you, know, you, you balance family in that too. Um, I can't say I always did all of it well. I just did it to the best of my ability at the time. And I think looking back on that now, I, I realize there's things I wish I could have done better or been stronger at, but um, that was the mix that worked for me. Mm -hmm. I also had a really great mentor at the law school who shared with me that um, demands of private practice are high, no matter what you do, whether you're in government, you're in um, you know, big law, medium-sized law, small law, in terms of like firm size, or um, you know, if you're doing public interest work, we as lawyers put a lot of time into it and we're thinking about it all the time. Um, but he shared with me, look at, with that career, you bring such a wealth of resources that you can give back to your community as well on a broader scale. And that really motivated me to keep pushing through even when things you know, felt like they were harder. That's awesome. Um, something, and, and if the listeners can't tell, Emil and I both uh, respect Rebecca greatly, so you can feel the love that we're giving her. Hopefully she feels it too. <laughs> I do. Um, but there's something that Emil alluded to earlier, you know, when we were in law school, and even now, um, you know, you're everywhere. Uh, Rebecca and I have the great fortune of serving on the Judicial Selection Advisory Committee. Uh, we're governor appointees, and we help vet people for judge. Um, and that's really important because you want to ensure that the judges uh, who are on the bench reflect the communities that they serve in. So it's very important. Um, but I say Which, all that by the way, I think that committee has done a fantastic job, and I think it's been it's been historic the impact um, that uh, Governor Evers and that committee has had in terms of placing judges and minority judges and younger judges and people of color and women um, on the bench. I I, I don't know the, the 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 numbers by heart, but I. I think it's historic. It is. It's, it's the most um, it's diverse bench we've ever had in the state of Wisconsin. It's. it's you know, I don't think you understand. Most people don't understand the impacts of, of, of walking into court um, and seeing judges and seeing not just older judges, but judges of all creeds and all of that. I'll never forget this. Um, I think it was Judge Childs. I, I was in his court um, for, for a case once upon a time, and um, my opposing counsel um, worked at the city attorney's office, an attorney called, I think his name, uh, that was uh, Tyrone Sand Jr. He's, he's now in-house. And midway through the proceedings, um, we had a judge stop the court proceedings and had us come to the back and said, hey, I've been on the bench for some time. This is the first time I've ever had both lawyers in a non-criminal context, in a civil context, and the judge all be black. Mm -hmm. And, it, and this, was, this, was, this was like three years ago. And I just, just a little side comment, it matters. And, it you know, matter. and I think you guys have done some fantastic, um, some work in, in moving that needle. Um, so bravo to you, Kristen, bravo to you, uh, Rebecca, and thank you on behalf of the legal profession. Oh yeah, no problem. But I was kind of teeing that up to say, you know, Rebecca is a face that you see everywhere. And something that I really do respect about you, it's very easy to lose yourself um, in law, right? Mm -hmm. And forget where you come from, it's like we're always, as people of color, we are always straddling this fence, it's this dichotomy, like you are who you are here, how you have to show up in the profession, but when you're home, you are whoever you were growing up, That's that right. is, you, you revert right back to what that is, and no one cares about your fancy degree and your job, no one cares, you are who you are. Um, so you ha you're everywhere, you know, you're everywhere in the sense of, you always are filling your cup in the community and you're showing up at work to make partner and then you're involved with all these other legal activities and sitting on panels and, and sitting on boards. So for a young lawyer saying that, they may be saying to themselves, I need to do all the things Rebecca did in order to make partner, I have to do these things. I'm trying to get your reaction to that. Um, do you think that's always the right way for young lawyers to approach it or do you think there is some kind of magic sauce or how do you think um, young lawyers should be thinking about these outside activities when they are looking to make partner internally at their firms? Yeah, I mean, it, it's so the short answer is there's no one specific path to getting there. Like everybody's path is going to be a little bit different. And if you were to bring other people who are partners at their firms, their stories are, are all going to have a different avenue to get there. Mm 
Um, and I can tell you that being everywhere sometimes has cut against me and I've had to overcome a perception or belief that, you know, maybe I wasn't allocating my time exactly where I needed to. I think, um, so I can't say like my way is the way mm -hmm. it's because it's not, um, it just happened to be my way and mm -hmm. I'm happy to share what that way was. But I think in terms of what I hear from firm leaders, from firms all across the state, First and foremost, they want to see people who are substantively strong. Mm -hmm. And so if you, you can take a step back um, from other things that you're doing and really hone in those first few years on really becoming a good attorney, mm -hmm. the rest you can keep building on. There'll be opportunity to give back, to be present. Um, and you can do so in a way that I think is sustainable for a career. Now, Kristen, you're everywhere too, right? Yes, like I yes. see you and you're giving back and, and you are working really hard and you're a phenomenal attorney. You're a really great friend. Emil, you're the same way. You're entrepreneurial. You're out there. You're working really hard with clients. You're also giving back to the state bar. I mean, I'm, I'm going to miss like 12 things that each of you are doing. <laughs> and I, I know that both of you are equally out there and we know the toll that that can take. Yes. And sometimes that can be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I, I think even at this stage, what I'm trying to do is get back to basics and think about maybe less but less with the highest quality that I can give it, right? So that yeah. um, I don't feel stretched as thin. So I don't want people to feel like they have to do everything. The one caveat that I will say, though, is that throughout my career, there have been times where people have given me advice, and I think it's great to get advice. I think you as an individual should think about what resonates with you, what works for you, and what might not. Not everything that somebody tells you is going to work for you, and it's Absolutely. okay. Um, and so in some ways, like I, I made my own path, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people make their own path and how they're going to get there. I don't, um, for example, come from... Um, a business background or a family with a lot of business ties, that's helpful in, uh, you know, big law if you have some of those connections. But I think if you're a genuine person, you can form relationships. Mm -hmm. You can form those with, with anyone, and that can then lead to work too. So um, focusing on what your qualities and traits are and your strengths are and then flexing those is really important and remembering that you have those. I think sometimes we compare ourselves to everything else that's going on or what everybody else has done, and yeah. it can... Um, lead to being self-conscious or addressing our self-esteem. But I think remember that you have great qualities and skills that are unique to you that you're bringing to the table yeah. and see how you can maneuver those to, to get to the partnership track. But first few years, focus on substance. I love that you <laughs> yeah. said, one, I let two things you said. One, getting back to the basics because I'm right there with you where it's like, okay, I don't need to do 20 things. Let me do three things that matter to me a lot and then one thing internally with the company and let that be it. Um, so I totally get you there. But then also I love that you said focus on the practice because yeah. Emil and I talk about this all the time. Like we worry sometimes the people coming fresh out of law school, they look at some of us who are very engaged and they go, oh, well, that's what I need to do. It's like, well, no, we're, we've been out of law school a while. Mm -hmm. So that's what we need to do because we've been out. Um, and now we have that responsibility. But the first couple of years, you need to learn how to be a really good lawyer. That's right. And then everything else will follow. Emil, did you have something that felt like hit you off? Yeah, I think that's something we've been very cautious about. Um, we, we primary Our primary audience of the show tends to be younger lawyers. Um, and... You know, I'm aware of, uh, you know, Chris and I were aware of our visibility and all that stuff, and we don't want to ever create the impression that you have to do all of this stuff at the right time at the expense of your career, because at the end of the day, I mean, you are an attorney. I mean, if you are going to practice law, which it is called practice in law for a reason, it requires that you put in the work and hone in on being a good lawyer. And I've never liked the phrase, fake it till you make it. I've always hated it. I've always been all about, like, putting your heads down, really working hard at it, be good at it, and, you know, and, and, and make it and you can talk about it, right? Um, and I, I, I don't know if it's, I don't want to call it, maybe, maybe, it's, a, maybe it's, a, it's a social media or Instagram effect where people feel like, you know, if I could just portray or present to the world that I'm this, despite not being as good as I actually am, I can just kind of skate by. And I think younger, some younger lawyers might be focusing their time on the wrong things initially, right? Um, and the problem with that is we have a profession where you're going to get found out, like period. If you're not good at what you do, it's pretty hard to fake it 
because you're going to get found out, right? It's not just pure oratory, you know? You have to draft the contracts. You have to write the briefs. You have to try the cases. You have to give that counsel. Um, and if you're a fraud, you will be found out. And at that point in time, you know, it might be a little too late um, to, 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 to sort of retrace your steps. Um, but I think that that's something that's very important because people see you now, right, for what you, for everything that you've done and for everything you've accomplished, right? And oftentimes I think they miss the story. They miss the journey, right? Um, and it's like, no, don't start at the end. That's, that's the beginning is, like, you really hold on. But at the same time, that's not saying to deny them their sense of self and all the things that they are, right? You are a Latina, you're a woman, you're, you're a mother, you're your wife, um, you know, you, you, you come from, you know, your, your, your families, your family, your, your parents are immigrants. You have all these different elements. And I've seen all of those different things expressed in the work that you do in the community, every single one of them and every single thing that you're identified by. Um, and it's, I think it's a question of the intensity, when to ramp it up and when not to. And I always tell folks, you can dabble in those things, but I think in the you know, for the first three, four or five years of your career, just just really focus on the most important thing, which is being a good, being a damn good lawyer. Can I say damn on the show? <laughs> Joe just looked at me weird. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so I know y your time is limited because you are a partner. Can I just one 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 yeah. question? I just want like top three things law students or young associates are listening to this right now mm -hmm. and they want to make partner. Your top three nuggets. I put her on the spot, guys. I didn't ask her this beforehand. <laughs> but three little nuggets for them to lean into if they want to one day aspire to be partner. And and, and tell us how long it took you to make partner too. It took ten years. Ten years. Took okay. Ten years, yeah. So what are some just words of advice, last last words of advice? So, um, you know, we've talked about it, I, I think, you know, being really good at your practice and figuring and, and figuring out what you get excited about in the practice. Um, now, we all come in and I think, you know, to Emil's point, we all come in and I think a lot of us feel like we're not really capable or qualified, like there's a little voice. And, and one of the ways that you can combat that is by taking advantage of your resources. And so your resources are everywhere. They are within you to read more, study more, try and become more knowledgeable. You you have control over that. That's mm -hmm. something you can do. It's also the people you surround yourself with and the mentors you seek out, even if it's for a one-off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, reach out to those people and schedule those meetings and, and learn from them and their experiences. Um, and, you know, when you're in law school, it's your professors or there might be tutors. I mean, take advantage of that. Um, really dig in and give yourself the ability to really focus on that. Um, so that's in terms of like just focusing on your practice. The the second piece is maintain your relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean you have to like call, um, you know, the CEO of Northwestern Mutual tomorrow. You can try and do that. That's fine. But sometimes it's just maintaining good relationships with your classmates who you're graduating with and grabbing lunch or dinner with them or, you know, going, you know, catching a sporting event or, you know, going to the spa together. Mm -hmm. Maintain those relationships because I think they're helpful in realizing that a lot of us are going through a lot of the same things at the same time in our careers. And so it can be helpful to know you're not alone. But also those are the people that, you know, in 10 years are going to be doing some really incredible, great things. And so I tell this to my daughter all the time, like those relationships should be authentic, but there's a lot of wonderful people doing incredible things around you. Mm -hmm build those relationships even when they first start out. Everyone's got a value, so maintain those relationships. And then the last thing is um, don't lose sight of the things that help keep you grounded and focused and fulfilled. And so, you know, making time for family, making time for just reflection. Um, if you like to read books, figure out how to read books. If you like to play a sport, you know, find a way to do that. It, you know, it's, it's probably things you've heard a million times before, but if you can focus on those three things, then the rest of it won't seem
team is overwhelming. And so for me, I don't really have hobbies. Um, uh, so <laughs> I don't have anything <laughs> exciting to share about like being able to like, um, you know, do crochet or anything like that. But my- um, You're a great cook. I do I like say. to cook. Yeah. I do love to cook. <laughs> the kitchen done. Yeah, I got Are the you? kitchen done. Yay. Yes, the kitchen's done. Um, but uh, for me, it is it is giving back to my community. Like that's what I, that is what I like to do. And then I spend a fair amount of time with that, but that's because um, that's, you know, that's what gets me most like motivated. Mm -hmm. So, but those three things, and um, like I said, your resources, your relationships, they're gonna be helpful to you. And there's, there's a lot of people out here that wanna see you succeed. So just know that you have a cheerleading squad. That's awesome. That's a great way to end our podcast. Thank you so much, Rebecca Lopez. Thanks, Thanks for Rebecca. having me, guys. This is awesome. <laughs> this, this is great. Awesome. Yeah. Congratulations and everything. Absolutely. You. You're amazing. So oh, happy you guys for you. Are. I'm just, you know, in awe. And, like, I'm always excited when I see all the incredible work both of you are doing all thank the time. So oh, thank you for thank all that you. you're doing. We're trying to be like you when we grow up. That's all. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the goal. We've made it. Right. Just like Rebecca Lopez, and then I'm, I'm all Then good. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm sad. <laughs> like blushing so hard. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Well, thanks so much to Rebecca Lopez for joining us. Um, she talked about a lot of interesting things, Emil, that I think you and I talk about personally, you know, filling your cup and being involved with outside things. So, mm -hmm. Emil, I'm going to pose the question to you. How do you fill your cup? Uh, in addition to just your practice. What do you oh, do geez. outside? We know you like to work out. We follow your Instagram. <laughs> and we know you have a lot of time with the babies. Um, and you like soccer. So what else are you doing outside of that? Or are those the things you do to fill your cup? Yeah. It, so s sort of like Rebecca, I, I don't have... I don't have a set hobby, right? I don't, I don't fish. I don't hunt. Um, my hobbies are, might, might be best uh, described as just talking shit with good friends oh and eating God. good food. <laughs> oh, we can blur that part out. <laughs> I'm sure Joe's going to do a little beep, beep. <laughs> uh, no, but, but I, I think that I, I like to commune mm -hmm. um, with, 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 with like-minded folks and different and people who don't think like me, but I, I love a good conversation over some good food, mm -hmm. over some good cocktails, right? Um, and... I, I know it sounds boring and terrible, but I, I, I crave, I, I find human beings very interested. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to hear about people's stories. I like to get to know about them. Um, so which leads to, to the extent that, you know, you could classify it as a hobby, you know, traveling, right? So my wife and I, um, we travel, uh, we go someplace at least once every six weeks, six weeks or, um, or two months. Um, my wife has a very busy career, uh, busy career. she's a VP of HR um, at a, at a, at a mid-sized company, um, and it takes a lot uh, out of her as well. So we have two very demanding professions, and um, one of the ways that we try to fill our cups is we, it's very important that we go somewhere, and it doesn't have to be a big vacation. Sometimes it's, it's as easy as going to Minneapolis just for a weekend and seeing something we haven't seen before. Um, so. But the focus is just trying to just take in the world and take in all that's around us. Um, and yeah, I've obviously I love my sock. I'm a big Arsenal fan. Uh, and then from time to time, when I'm really frustrated, I write poetry. I'm a, I'm a poet. Oh. Um, yeah, it's all the right. sappy side of me. <laughs> um, but but you know, and I, and then I and I'm I'm very politically engaged. Um, not in the sense of you know, I'm not right. I haven't ran for office or done any of that stuff, but I, I keep my ears close to the grounds in terms of what's going on locally, nationally, um, and also statewide. And then I just talk a lot of politics. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it's not supposed to fill my cup. It frustrates me and fills my cup at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Filling your cup can be anything. I think all those things are what do you do? spot on. A lot of the same things. <laughs> um, I also like to have a really good meal. Um, we share that. Like, really good food. I'm so happy like when I'm eating good food. Yeah, me too. <laughs> like, like, it there's brings nothing me joy. <laughs> I love more than eating a really good meal um, and talking to people. Uh, but I am, you know, contrary to popular belief, quite introverted. So sometimes filling my cup is not talking to people. Like, I love Sundays when I can wake up mm. and talk to people as I wish to speak to them. <laughs> I can go grab my Starbucks and I can go read a book or I can clean up around the house or I can do things in silence. Yeah. Um, 
I'm really into audiobooks now. I used to think that was like fake reading. Uh, but then during the pandemic, I got a lot more into audiobooks. So I love listening to random books that um, Audible says I should listen to, whether I should or not. Sometimes I hate listening to some of those books, but it's still fun. Um, I do like to travel, even though it's been a little bit different post-COVID. It's been a lot of domestic travel. Um, yeah. But before, I always would go out of the country at least once, sometimes twice a year, somewhere fun and different and interesting that I've, I've never been. Um, I love going to places where people don't, where English is not the primary language. That's my favorite. Yeah. Um, because it's like, a, it's a different experience when you have to try to speak the language. Um, or where it's, you know, you're kind of figuring it out on your own because yeah. people are not, they're like, American, I don't really care. Um, <laughs> Especially in France not, and Paris. Like, so, you, you know, <laughs> I have never been to France and Paris, but Japan is what, I went to Tokyo, oh, and that wow. was one of my favorite places where it's like, it's, it's respect, right? We yeah. think the same thing in America. It's like, you know, you're here, so Attempted. respect and try. And that they were very much so, like, if you didn't try, they were like, all right, well. Um, and I love that. Like, yeah. Also, I love Tokyo. It's probably my favorite place. Um, well, one of the beautiful but, things about traveling to places that you're not familiar with or where they speak a different language is you, you quickly realize that there is a human language. Absolutely. That, that transcends you know, verbal or, or, or the spoken language or, or you know, there, there is, I, I've been in conversations outside of the country, you know, in a place where I don't speak the language and I'm talking to someone who doesn't understand English or doesn't necessarily speak English and I don't understand them and somehow we're able to figure it out. I think that's just beautiful. It is. I'll tell a quick story. So, because I think laughter transcends, transcends all languages, all cultures, wherever you are, laughter is a thing that kind of binds us together. Um, when I was in Tokyo, um, they, a lot of the restaurants don't have an English version of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. They have pictures. Uh, so I picked, it looks like, you know, beef or something. So I was like, oh, you know, can I get this pointing to it? And the, the waitress is trying to tell me no. And I'm like, yes, I, that's what I want. So she's, you know, I can tell she's getting frustrated. She goes to find someone who could speak English a little bit. And finally, and we're doing, you know, hand motions, playing charades, I find out it was tongue. And I think it was maybe cow's tongue or something. And I was like, oh, I don't want that. You never had cow's tongue? I never had, I had never had, no, I, and I still haven't had it. But, and after that whole thing, they laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> I mean, the whole back of the house is laughing. Then they come out and I, she's telling the story and they're laughing. And it was in the restaurant, the hotel we were staying in. Um, so every time we would pass, they're like waving and laughing. <laughs> they thought it was hilarious. Um, and I just, it's a, it's a funny story, but that's, you know, that's it, laughter. We all can laugh at that because it was ridiculous and I didn't want cow's tongue. I thought it was. It's a taco joy. It, it's a very popular ingredient for tacos. Okay. As well. Like, it's a taco Never joy knew. that has some really good cow tongue tacos. Yeah. Let's try it. I mean, look, I'll try anything <laughs> once, but the fact that she, they were so like, you don't want that, no. And I kept going, they just I know what I at want. You, like, no, you probably don't, don't want like, that. Don't she's want not going to like that. Well, I thought it was uh, just beef. <laughs> you, you know, you, you said something about one, how you like to retreat, and it reminded me about what I did last year. So um, you may be an introverted, but, you know, you do a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're, we, I, I, we have so many different facets and so many different spaces that we appear in um, on a daily basis. You know, for, for me especially, I, I, I start my day at 5.30, 6 a.m., and I go till about midnight. Um, that's Monday through Friday. Um, Saturdays, I usually save for my kids, and I do no work on Saturdays and, um, and, and Sundays as well until about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and I got to start my week <laughs> by preparing for the week. But um, October last, October of last year, and so it was always a weird time for me because it's also when my father passed away, um, I had a friend um, out in Canada who is a big Arsenal fan in Arsenal. They're a soccer team out in London, um, currently top of the league. Um, and their arch rivals are called to the Tottenham Hotspurs, and it's called, in the game, it's called the North London Derby whenever Arsenal plays um, Tottenham. And it's always been my dream to want to go to North London and watch this. And my friend's like, hey, you know, let's, let's do it. Um, and he was only going to come in for a day and all that stuff. And I thought about it. I saw the tickets. They were a little cheaper. And so I, I told my wife, my, hey, like, I'm just going to go on the strip of myself, right? So I got to London Thursday. I left on, on, on Monday. So I was there for about three days. And 
I only had my friend around for, I think, one of those days when we went to the North London Derby game. But that was the first time in a very, very long time I had been on a trip by myself. Mm. And I remember the most liberating or the most, one of the most filled I'd been was waking up the very first night, the very first morning, and realizing that I had nowhere to be. Mm. I had nothing I had to do. It was so liberating and freeing. Obviously, my wife's like, okay, oh hey, God. you just yeah. left me with three kids. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're finding enlightenment but and all of that stuff. But I know, but, but I was, and I, and, I, and I strongly encourage everyone um, who, who, especially folks who are so hyper and, and who do a lot to, to do that mm -hmm. because I oftentimes imagine that on our death beds when we take our last fleeting breath of life we're going to realize that we've met a lot of people we've gotten to know a lot of people but the person we got to least meet and get to know and we wanted to know the most was ourselves mm. and um and so I, I i encourage i encourage people to get to know sense and it's also hard to kind of explore and and, and get to have that those silent moments when you're always on the go i i strongly suggest going to a different environment it doesn't have to be london it could be like geneva for for a day or two yeah. just just to be by yourself um to to dig into yourself um and, and it, it, was, it was it was very liberating it was very fascinating and uh my, my wife that sees things differently, but yeah. I think well, she Well, you left her, so <laughs> I bet she it was did. It's been three days, but hey. When's the last time she could go out for three days um, and enlighten herself? Uh, last year. I, okay. I, I'm a big okay. fan of that. I, I, no, I, I know you are. I have, you know? have to do this first. <laughs> people don't know, so you have to let everybody here who's listening know. So, okay. But hey, I think uh, Rebecca was, you know, that was a good reminder on how, on, on how we could be all of these things, but... We, we have to fill our cup. And Absolutely. I think that was what I took out of that. And filling our cup leads to us being better at everything else that we do. Um, so yeah. uh, um, I, I think that that's, that's where we sort of live it at. Yeah. What do you think? That was awesome. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I'm all philosophical and stuff. Yeah, now, I see. You know. You're a poet. I'm so. all deep and stuff. Yeah, oh, hey, who knew? <laughs> well, hey, you know, I, I unfortunately, I'm not W.B. Yeats good, so... <laughs> <laughs> a lifetime of poetry will mean eating stick, and uh, I kind of like to eat good food, and we like to travel. So. <laughs> Thank you all for listening to another episode of Bottom Up. Oh. Uh, please let us know in the comments, wherever you may listen, if there are comments, what you would like to hear more of, and who you'd like to see us bring on to the next episode. Thanks for listening. Peace. <laughs>